That is so good, amen? amen. Sam, let's find a seat, buddy. Come have a seat. All right. Well, welcome everyone again. You ready? Yes. You better get ready. You know, um, we've been talking about breakthrough, and we've been talking about a tipping point. Amen? Yes. Yes. And so I think this is like part 10, 11, something like that. And um, I'm going to challenge you to take notes on this one, because I challenge you all the time. But there's a lot of this, this last, I'm going to get into some things that um, I, I really believe will just help you in the future. Sam? Thank you. Nope. Nope. That's enough. So, the, the, the subtitle, if you would, today is What to Do Between the Breakthrough and the Manifestation. Come on. How many people have had some breakthroughs in their life, but they haven't seen the full manifestation of what God has promised? What do you do during that period of time? And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And I want you to grab hold of this because even young people, there's something that you can grab hold of and it will change your life. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know, as we have taken the responsibility and prepared ourselves by listening to God and encouraging training the church to do the same, it is now in your court. Look at me, look at me. It doesn't matter what's going on out there. It's now, right here, focused here. Because it is in your court. Say, it's in my court. It's in my court. As whether or not you're going to take up the mantle and the responsibility for yourself. I can't take up that responsibility for you. It's up to you to take up the responsibility God has given you. Amen? Amen. I really love what Paul's encouragement to the believers in Ephesians is. We're going to flip to Ephesians 6 and we're going to read a passage that I know that most of you are like, yes, I know that scripture, but I want to look at it in just a clear, beautiful way. <laughs> Ephesians 6, verse 10. It's talking about the armor of God. And I'm reading out of the NLT. It says, Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18, it says... A final word. How many people know that whenever somebody says a final word, that's really something you need to hold on to, right? It's like, look, everything else I've said, this is the last thing I want you to grab hold of. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. If you want to be, how many people want to be one of those that are strong in the Lord? Let me see those hands raised up. Come on now, that's important, right? We want to be one of those that are strong in the Lord. Then he lays out the plan on how we become strong. See, that's what the purpose is of Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Is to give you the, the guidelines and the direction how to become strong. Verse 11, it says, put on all of God's armor. Say all. All. Yeah, we are. All of God's armor. So that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. How many of the yes. strategies? All. Come on, this, this is important stuff. Verse 12, it goes on. For you, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood. Turn to your enemy and say, I'm not fighting against you. <laughs> I'm not fighting against you. Turn to the other neighbor and say, I'm not fighting against you. <laughs> Come on now. See, and that's one of the things I think so many times in church, we look at somebody because they've offended us and we're like, that's it. I have you up. The vex with you. The dog with you up. And they see, you see them walking to church and you just turn your back and we've got to get rid of that foolishness. We've got to get rid of that unforgiveness. Because until we do, until we do we're going to be locked up. Say locked up. No. You don't want to be locked up, do you, David? No. You want to be free to do what God's called you to do. Amen. We do not fight against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authority. I want you to see that word right there. It says evil do it, evil Evil, what was it? Evil rulers and what? Authority. Authorities. I want you to understand that they have authority in the earth. Yes. And we have to understand that we have a greater authority. Come on, somebody. Amen. We have a greater authority of the unseen world. And against mighty powers in this dark world. Yeah. Against what? 
peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Where does the peace come from? The good news. Oh, and what is the good news? The Word of God. Oh, do you, I'm going to tell you something. When I started looking at this and we're just meditating on it, the amount of times that the, the armor of God is really talking about the Word. Right. Is just sitting here saying, look, it's not talking about something to hold your pants up. It's not talking about something to, that you're wearing so that whenever you're walking on the rocks, it's not hurting you. It's talking about, look, in the middle of you, put the word. On your feet, put the word. Everywhere that you are, put the word. Yes. Yes. Secure it to yourself. And let everything that is on you be secure from the word that is in you. Because the belt, everything is connected. The breastplate is connected to the belt. Come on, man. Just get the revelation with this guy. Verse 16. In addition to all of these things, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the what? The devil. The devil. What are we putting up? Shield of faith. Shield of what? Faith. Ah. And this is the faith in who? God. Faith in God and His word. word. Come on, Paul, you get it. That He will not leave us, that He's not going to abandon us. Why do we know that? Because His word said that. Not in the promises that He made. Come on, your faith is not in the promise that He made you. Your faith is in the promiser that promised it. Amen. Come on now. Yes. But how many times do we grab hold of the promise that we haven't yet received and then we think that the promiser is the one that's messed up? No, it's not the promiser. It just hasn't been manifest yet in this place. Yes. His promise is forever settled yes. because he is forever settled. Yes. Amen. Amen. The promises are only as good as the one that is promising. We need to shift our focus to the one who is promising and not what he is promising. The one that is promising. Verse 17 goes on and it says, Put on the salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God. Oh man, <laughs> yes sir. All the way through. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. I really hope that what you're seeing is how this armor is focused on His words. His word is the foundation of what we must believe. If you're believing in anybody else, if you're believing in the pastor, you're believing in the wrong thing. If you're believing in, oh, that song is what's going to get me through, you're believing in the wrong thing. If you're believing in what your bank account says, you're believing in the wrong thing. Amen. If you're believing in what your auntie said who died, you're believing in the wrong thing. Amen. you got to believe in the Word of God. Yes. Come on, Sam, you're getting it. <laughs> Many places of higher learning are tearing apart the truth and the infallibility. In other words, uh, the Total perfection and the total truth of what the word is. They're tearing it apart. Saying, oh, no, no, no. That was for then. Right, Rasad? It's not for now. It is for now. It is for now, but the lie that the higher education places are trying to tell you is doing this. So what do we do between the breakthrough and the manifestation? We have to stand strong. When they do, when they tear apart those foundations of everything God has said or promised, what do we do at that moment? Youth, when you hear, oh, you need to respect from the church at devotions, or from school and the devotions, and then all of a sudden, on the next turn, you see the same people that say you need to respect cussing and tearing you up. What do you do? You have to realize that those things that are being said are coming from a person that doesn't have the revelation of the Word of God in their life. Because if they have the revelation, they're going to be able to stand in that revelation. Christianity, or the Bible, is no longer the standard by which Christians live. I'm going to tell you that. What did I just say, Ricardo? 
You've got to hear me now. You're here on purpose. Be here on purpose. Christianity, nor the Bible, is no longer the standard by which Christians live. I'm just telling you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you... I'm going to get there in just a minute. The new prevailing worldview is syncretism. That's a word I've never heard of until this week. I want to get to it. I want you to hear me. Syncretism is the blending of elements from numerous unbiblical, say unbiblical, unbiblical, unbiblical worldviews along with a few biblical views that are popular and accepted in society. That's what's spreading throughout all churches. Example. I'm going to give you an example of this. How many people like prosperity? Oh, we don't want lack. Come on, we all want prosperity. Yeah! We're going to jump up and down on that one, right? I like prosperity. I like God's grace because God's grace covers me from all the sin I'm doing. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for that. It does not. God's grace. Okay, but you hear me. I'm going to get this is the example that, that the world and the church is grabbing hold of. This is not what I believe. Hear me. Oh, I accept everyone. I'm not going to judge. If I have feelings, if I feel like, I, if I have feelings towards someone, I can sleep with them because I have feelings. No, that's the flesh. That's the lust of the flesh. Oh, lying's okay if it keeps me out of trouble or if it won't hurt others. Oh, in a relationship with unbelievers, oh, that's okay. Homosexuality, oh, that, that's okay. It's acceptable. Or abortion, oh, you know what? It, it, if I'm not ready to have a baby, then it's okay to go ahead and have an abortion. See, this is what society and this is what churches as a whole are grabbing hold of. Say, not in this church. Not in this church. Not in this believer. See, you've got to grab hold of the fact that's not what the Word says. I'm going to stand on what the Word says, and I say homosexuality is a sin. I'm going to say abortion is a sin. I'm going to say it's wrong. I still love the person who commits it, but I'm going to call sin, sin. See, that's where believers and unfortunately pastors have just said, oh, it's okay, you're a young person, go ahead and sow your oats. <laughs> it doesn't matter, when you get older, then you can come to Jesus and live the right way. I say, no, young people shall serve the Lord and they shall not depart from the things of God. It says, rise up, raise up a child in the way they shall go when they are old, they shall not depart from it. Come on, that's not good. I'm not going to have my kids go out and do foolishness. Amen. They're going to love Jesus all the days of their life. Amen. Yes. They're going to hold fast to the truth of the word of God. Amen. Why? To keep ourselves from that foolishness, we must stir ourselves up in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on. I'm going to tell you, if you don't have your prayer language, if you're not baptized with the Holy Spirit yet, it is something that you've got to grab a hold of because that's what's going to stir you up to keep you on the right path. Yeah. I can't tell you a day goes by that I do not spend time praying in the Holy Ghost because I need His wisdom. I need His direction. I need His guidance to be able to say, is this right or is that right? My feelings are split both ways, but I'm going to lock into what the Holy Spirit is directing me and guiding me to do. We've got to stir ourselves up in the Holy Spirit, asking Him to guide us in all truth, not man's opinion. Yes. Verse 18. Pray in the Holy Spirit at all times. How long? At all times. At all times. And on every occasion. What if you're around people that don't believe God? Come on, that's the best time to do it. Sunday night, come on, that's the time. Why? Because, you know what, you've got to stop them from their foolishness. No, 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 you're not going to be talking gossip around me. I'm putting the brakes on that. You want to talk foolishness and start cussing? I'm going to start praying in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Come on, we've got to 
situation that says no longer am I allowing the devil to have authority in this place because I'm pulling up the authority which God has given me and I'm going to walk it out in the power of the word of God. Amen. Come on, man. If you're not stirred up by now, something's wrong with you. I mean, maybe I need to come and lay hands on you. <laughs> come on now. It's because it's becoming easier for Christians to lie. Not me. <laughs> wow, that went over the internet. <laughs> Never mind. Love covers. We... <laughs> it's easier for Christians to become angry and lose their peace. To live a life of sin and compromise all around because it doesn't really matter. I'm here to tell you it does matter. Yes. How you live this life is going to be how you spend eternity. Amen. Yes. Faith. That is something like, well, I wish it would happen. And no one really knows what God will do anyhow. So it doesn't make sense to stand believing it. No! Faith is believing in the word of God and not being able to be moved to the right or to the left just because people think a certain thing. Right. Lock into what he's saying. I think I can make something happen faster and better. Come on now. You can't do the things the right way if you're doing it your way. To do things the right way has to be God's way. Yes. See, the world is changing and we don't live like that anymore. Unfortunately, these statements that are coming out are truer for believers than what the Word is. You've got to lock into what the Word is. Amen. See, the last three weeks, the last... This last week, three different times. Say three different times. Three different times. I was told about a study that had come out by separate individuals. Why am I stirred up? Because I'm not going to allow this foolishness to continue. I'm calling sin, sin, what it is. This study was just completed back in March of 2022. Just a few days ago, in other words. It was about a biblical worldview and how pastors no longer have a biblical worldview. I do, you're right. I have a biblical worldview. And what percentage of them believe the Bible and have a biblical worldview? You ready for this? This is so sad and so shocking. Senior pastors that have a biblical worldview, 41% of senior pastors have a biblical worldview. 59% do not believe what the Bible says. Whatever the Bible says is what I believe. No matter what the Bible says, that's what I believe. The Bible calls homosexuality sin. That's what I believe. The Bible says abortion is wrong. That's what I believe. Do you understand? Very simple. But they don't. 28% of associate pastors believe the Bible. So that is 72% of associate pastors say the Bible is not what causes me to live my life. The way I live. Right. 78. Can you believe that? Past, we're talking pastors. Only 13% of teaching pastors believe the Bible and teach the Bible as the Word of God. 12%. Youth, look at me. You are fortunate that you have a youth pastor that's your senior pastor. That's your pastor that loves you, that believes the Word of God, because only 12% of youth pastors or children's pastors believe the Bible as the way to live your life. This one's really shocking. Executive pastors. Executive pastors are pastors that take care of all the business of the church. 4% have a biblical worldview. 
And you want to know why the church is having such an issue with divorce, having such an issue with adultery, having such an issue with all of the other foolishness that's going on? Because we don't take the Word of God anymore for what the Word of God is as the truth and the way to walk and the way to live. Yes. You know, you might be saying, man, pastors really need to get on with the program. And I would say you are 100% correct. But unfortunately, it's not just the pastors. As the pastors are, so goes the church. You ready? Parents, what's your biblical worldview? 2%. 2% of parents have a biblical worldview. Of parents who call themselves Christian? Of parents. In general, as a whole. If the pastors don't believe, and they're not teaching a biblical worldview, how can we expect the body of Christ to have a biblical worldview? I'm telling you what, when I heard this from three different sources this last week, it has stirred me up that I am not going to back down, which I never have. I'm not going to slow down. I'm going to hit the accelerator, and I'm going to go faster than ever, and I'm going to stand louder, and I'm going to be able to say, no longer is that acceptable where I am. Yeah, yeah. You're going to start talking foolishness? Prove it in the Bible. And if you can't prove it in the Bible, shut your mouth. Come on now. Because the Word of God is the only thing in which I can stand and put my life on to say, this is true. Yes, how is that possible? Because the church is now all about feelings. All about attendance. All about giving. If I offend them, then they'll not give. Come on now, how foolish is that? Is God not your provider? Amen. Is God not your source? Yes. Oh, it's all about size and music. Oh, let me get the right move and feel. And no, is God not the Holy Spirit that can move in any situation? Yes, he is. It's about a performance. Let's make sure the lights are just right. Come on, shine Holy Spirit and give us the light of the Holy Spirit in a place. Amen. Instead, it's about heresy. Heresy is a big word that we are all, oh, no, no, don't say that word. Heresy is taking what the Bible says and mixing it with what the world thinks. Worldview. I need to be relatable. No, we need Jesus and we need His Word. Amen. We must stand on the truth of God's Word. Why? Because the truth of God's Word is unchangeable. It will not change just because we feel a certain way. Until we have that settled and permanent, we're only going to be tossed to and fro. We're only going to be moved by every single wind of doctrine. Paul said, don't be moved by every wind of doctrine. Why? He said, look, it's happened back then, but it's happening even more right now than ever before. If you're moved, you're never going to see the manifestation of the promises God has for you. Why? Because you become unstable in all your ways. And the Bible goes on to say, and you shall not think that you're going to receive anything from the Lord. Amen. So what do we do? From the time that we get the breakthrough until the manifestation, stand firm. But number one, you ready? Here it is. Believe God's promises are true. Yes. What does that really say? You believe what the Word of God says. Yes. Numbers 23, 19. I'm going to give you scripture to back up everything I say. Because if I don't, then don't believe it until you see it in the Word. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man, so He does not lie. He is not human, so He does not change His mind. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. He has never spoken and failed to act. He is, he has he ever promised and not carried it through. Let me just shout it out. No! Amen. Numbers 23, 19. To believe his promises are true, I must believe God is true. Yes. I can't believe his promises are true unless I believe God is true. Right. Because he's the one that gave me the promises. I must believe that God is true and faithful, and unchangeable, and always, He is the, always the focus of my belief. Yes. 
Yeah. It's not of what I'm going to get at the end of the day. It's the fact that I've already got God, and with Him, that's more than enough. Amen. Not what I'm going to get. Number two. So number one was what? Believe, Believe God's promises are true. Number two, now you can say it loud and strong, Paula. Stand firm. firm on the promises. Hebrews 6, 10 through 20. I know you're like, man, you're giving me so much scripture. Why not? That's what we need to live by. Hebrews, Hebrews 6, 10 through 20. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and, to, and the love you have demonstrated for his name. And having served and continue to serve the saints. But we passionately, we what? Passionately want each of you to demonstrate the same eagerness for the fulfillment of your hope until the end. So that you may not be sluggish. Those people that are sluggish need to wake up, shake yourself. Get that sluggishness spirit off of you. But imitators of those who, through faith and perseverance, inherit the promises in the same way God wanted to demonstrate more clearly to the heirs of the promise that his purpose was unchangeable. And so he intervened with an oath so that we who have found refuge in him may find strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us through two unchangeable things since it is impossible for God to lie. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, sure and steadfast, which reaches inside behind the curtain where Jesus, our forerunner, entered on our behalf since he became the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What's that saying? Look, we've got to not be concerned about what everybody else is saying, but we've got to reach into the presence of God and lock in and anchor into his presence Instead of being moved to and fro by what people are saying, they're going to say a lot of different things, aren't they, Miss Tomlin? We've got to hold on to the truth of this word. No matter what anyone else says or does, no matter what you see or think, don't move from the promise, because if you do not grow weary, what? You shall reap. You shall obtain those promises. Number three, keep praising and worshiping on your way to victory. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm on my way to victory. 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 Yes. Nehemiah 8, 10. Go and celebrate with a feast. <laughs> See, that's, that's a word from God right there. I love you. Amen. Go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drink. And share gifts of food with people who don't have, who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before the Lord. Don't be dejected and sad. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be sad. <laughs> For the joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on now. If you need some strength today, grab hold of the joy of the Lord. Because that's what's going to give you your strength. Yeah. I want to tell you something. If the devil can steal your joy, he will be able to steal your promise. Because you're going to be turning and fainting and thinking of, oh, it hasn't happened yet. You know what? I want to tell you something. Yvonne and myself, every day we talk to each other about the goodness of God. And I'm going to tell you, in the morning, one of the first things that we say to each other, we're one day closer. Amen. We're one day closer. To what we're believing for, what we're standing for, I'm almost there. I'm a few more hours closer than I was the last time I saw you. I'm five minutes away. I'm five minutes closer. Come on now, why? Because it's in the inside of us. It's stirring it up because, you know what, his word is true because I can stand on his promises. Amen. Amen. The devil's not going to see. Even if I look at my bank account and say, that's not what I want. No, no, that's not what's going to concern my joy because I know in whom my future is secure. Amen. Yes. Amen. And because of that, I can be thankful. Number four, keep an attitude of thanks thankfulness. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, Ricardo. In what? Everything. In everything. Give thanks. 
For this is God's will for you in Christ. David, in everything, give thanks. Because that's God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing. Nada, nothing. Zilch, zero. Don't be anxious. Why? Because in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. So in other words, it's not, oh God, I need you. Won't you help me? Won't you help? No, it's God, I need you. And I thank you that you've been faithful before because I know that you're going to be thankful now and you're going to be faithful now. And Lord, I just thank you that in the middle of this, I can still praise you. Amen. I thank you that you've given me rest in my lungs to be able to worship you and celebrate you. Yes, we've got to continue to remain thankful because then our requests are made known to God. Number five, remain consistent, walking out your love for God. Remain what? Consistent. I've got to be consistent. I can't be up one minute and then down the next. I can't be happy ho-ho and then all of a sudden I'm low-low. We gotta continue to be steadfast, continuing to grow. Come on, say I'm growing. I'm growing. I'm, growing. I'm not done yet. I'm growing. Amen. I'm just not getting wide. I'm getting deep. <laughs> wide and sorry. Just... Yes, consistently walking out our love for God. How do we do that? I'm gonna give you a few ways to be consistent. Church attendance. Church attendance. Why? Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says. Let us think of ways to motivate each other. How in the world can I motivate you if I'm not seeing you? If I don't see you, I can't motivate you to do good works. So we've got to attend. We've got to be together, motivating one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage each other enthusiastically, especially now that we see the day of his return is drawing in. You know he's coming back soon. Yeah, you know it's just right around the corner. It's not long now. We're a day closer than we were yesterday. Yes. Whatever it is, we're a day closer now. Yes. The next way to do it is fellowship of believers. Fellowship of believers. First John 1 John 1.3 says, We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with God, the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. See, our fellowship is not just, oh, it's so good to be around you, but no, we're talking about the things of the Lord. You're being able to encourage me with what God has spoken to you, as I encourage you with what God has spoken to me. That's what true fellowship is. As a pastor that we all know and love said one time, fellowship is two fellows in a ship. We're going somewhere together. We're in a ship together. Yeah. And we've got to be fellows, you know, of the same thought process. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. The next thing to be able to remain consistent is prayer. Romans 12, verse 12 says, Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. Guess what? There's going to be trouble, but you can be patient in it. And keep on praying. If you haven't started praying, get on it. Kick it into gear. Because there's things that are in front of you you can only get there through prayer. Another pastor that I know used to say that prayer is the pavement for where I'm going in the future. If I don't pave the road in prayer ahead of time, it's going to be rough, bumpy, and it's going to be a lot of potholes that you're going to be harder to get there. And we're not talking paving the road like it is in Jamaica. We want a super highway. We want something that's smooth that we can get on that Autobahn and we can go 150 miles an hour and just be going, yes! I'm going closer to the promises of God Faster than I ever did before. Amen. Come on now. Y'all just are like, yeah, you're a little kid. No, I want to go fast. Because it's like, you know, you can go that fast because there aren't the bumps in front of us. There aren't those sharp curves. Oh, no, 
I messed up. Now I got to get back on the road. No, come on. We got to pray in the spirit. Pray and ask God, guide us, direct us so that we're doing it the way you want us to do it. Amen. Yes. Amen. The next one. Boldly walk in love and forgiveness. Yes. Boldly. Oh, you know, I'm just going to walk in love, but I'm not going to say anything. No, we got to bold about it, right? Look, if I start talking to you all about football, I can talk to you about Manchester United or what's the other one? Kane? No. Yeah, exactly. Little, little <laughs> worse or whatever it might be. As I said, see, I knew I could get turned up already. See, all of a sudden you start talking about these and people get all riled up. But if we grab hold of something that's important, why do we calm down when we're talking about God? We've got to stir it up. We've got to be bold about our walk with God and walk in love and forgiveness. Mark 11, 25 through 26 says, But when you are praying, see, you're supposed to be praying, right, Ricardo? But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against. Does it have anything to do with the other person? It has to do with who? You. Say me. me. That's right. It has to do with me. When I pray, first forgive anybody I have of. Mm. Why? So that your Father in Heaven will forgive your sins too. They don't even have to know that you have them up. Forgive them. Let it go. Continue to move on with God. And your sins will be forgiven too. The next one. Study the Word. Study other people's opinion. No! Study the Word. Joshua 1.8. We love this verse. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. How you, can you do everything that's written in it unless you know what is written in it? For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Other ways to be able to continue walking the way we should consistently with Jesus is giving, being a witness and demonstrating God's power of resurrection working through you. Those are different ways that we can do this. Amen? Amen. Look, these are not a rules of do's and don'ts or the way you need to act. But let me tell you something. This is the evidence, say evidence, evidence. of living your life submitted to Jesus. This is part of the biblical worldview that we must have to influence our choices and decisions as well as those around us. See, newsflash, we have been called to live in the tipping point. Karen, you have been called to live in the tipping point. Live in the tipping point. You have been called to live in the tipping point. And the outpouring of the power of God. We have been called to live in the tipping point and the power of God. Yes. 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 You haven't gotten it yet. You are called, Lavalette, to live in the tipping point and the power of God. Yes. When you're living in the tipping point, it's pouring out on you. You don't have to be sitting there saying, oh, when's it coming? Because you're in the tipping point and it's being poured out on you. And now you're just a conduit. Let me give it to you. You need some glory here. Let me give it to you. You need the presence of God. It's all over me right now. What is it you need? You're called to live in it. But what is it that's causing us not to live in it? Is the trappings of the world, the pools of this and pools of that. We've got to get back into what God is saying. Yes. But we, but to do that, we must live upright, righteous, virtuous, keeping the commands of God. This is not just passing thing that we do every once in a while, but it is our lifestyle. Right. It is our covenant that we say, yes, God, I am doing this. Yes and amen. I'm not going to get sidetracked. Hebrews 10, 38 says, Now the just, say that's me, the just shall live by faith. Why? Who am I living in faith? I'm living in faith that I'm living in your tipping point, God, because you are pouring out your blessings upon me. 
I am positioned correctly. I don't have not a let up. I don't have anybody up. I am clean between you and me. You tell me I'm doing something wrong. Lord, forgive me. I humble myself. I'm living in that tipping point. Yes. 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 The just shall live by faith. But anyone who draws back. But anyone who draws back. Who does what? Draws back. In other words, I'm not listening to what God says. I'm doing what I want. I'm going to lie. I'm going to steal. I'm going to sleep around. You fill in the blank. Anyone that draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The just shall live by faith. Who are the just? Those whose ways of thinking, feeling, and acting are wholly conformed to the will of God. Are wholly conformed to the will of God. Titus 1.8 says, Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined wife. This is life, not wife. Life. Why? This is talking about those people that are called to be elders or called to be followers of Jesus, basically. Be devout is what God says. Devout means reverencing God. Those who take a stand of faith are often misunderstood. But it is more important to stand for God than fall for people. Those who take a stand of faith are often misunderstood, but it's more important to stand for God than to fall for people. Amen. Acts 8.2 Stephen was just stoned. He was just stoned. But the Bible says some de devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. In other words, they didn't care who saw them or what happened or what they were doing because they just did what was right. They didn't matter if it was going to come against them in some way. They're going to do what's right. Don't let the passion and zeal for the things of God lose its place of importance. Instead, work diligently to keep first things first. Now, two more verses, guys. Rasan, two more verses. I hope you've got something, because if you haven't, you've missed an entire purpose of being here. Hebrews 10.32. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Think back when you first gave your life to Jesus. The friends that you were around, the people that laughed at you, that's only gonna, you're only gonna be there for a little bit. You're not gonna really live it out. Are you as passionate now than you were then? Hopefully we're not. Hopefully we're more so. Amen. Hopefully we're setting ourselves on fire more and more, and we're helping other people to be set on fire. You must remember when we keep Jesus first. God is then fighting for you. He is on the job even when it seems like you're all alone. Come on, somebody needs that word today. Amen. God is fighting for you even when it seems like you're all alone. Don't listen to the voices of the enemy. Focus on Jesus and what he is saying. He always tells us the right things. Amen. And our kids' corner verse. I know you never thought that I was going to actually get to it. 2 Kings 19.6-7 The prophet replied, Say to your master, Say to your master, This is what the Lord says. Don't be disturbed by this blasphemous speech against me from the Assyrian king's messengers. Listen, I myself will move against him, and the king will receive a message that he is needed at home. So he will return to his land where I will have him killed with a sword. Look. Stand in what God has said. Trust him. Trust his word. 
Trust that he's the one fighting for you, and you don't figure out how he's doing it and what he's doing, but stay firmly planted on the fact that he is doing it. Yes. Your job is not to understand how or even when. It is to remain confident that he is doing it. Are you confident today? Are you listening to his voice? I know for me, it's something that I have to constantly come back to. Is this what he's speaking? If he's speaking this, I'm fully persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has committed unto me until the day he brings it about. And until the day he brings it about, I'm staying in his presence. I'm staying in position in the tipping point where he's pouring out the overflow of his blessings. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, Heavenly Father, I just ask you right now to continue to pour out your spirit upon us. I ask you right now just to invade this moment. Invade each of our thoughts. Invade each of our, our, our situations. Lord, you know everything from the right to the left, from the high to the low, and everything in between. And we just ask you right now to speak clarity into these things. First of all, we say thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you are working and moving in these situations. Thank you that you are Lord over the situations. Thank you, Lord, that you are speaking clearly to us and that we're not moved to the right or to the left, but we are locked in steadfastly on your word and on your truth. Thank you that we will not be the ones that throw out the biblical worldview, but we will grab hold of what you are speaking in your word because we know that it is settled yesterday, today, and forever. It is always settled. And we will hold on to it. Lord, thank you for being here with us today. We ask you to continue to guide us and direct us in all truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.